Well, I'm very happy to be here. I've enjoyed uh, all of the presentations, and they all seem to make up uh, a coherent story. To be honest, there's just too many uh, information to condense. So it's very difficult for me to go through all of those years and try to, uh, you know, just pick out a few things that I could use for today. But, um, but I did, um, and so some of it will be a repetition of some of the things other people have said. To begin with, I was born and raised in California, a second generation immigrant. Uh, I have raised seven children in the Central Valley, and I'm very proud of them. They all have college degrees. I come from migrant roots. My mother began working in the fields when she was probably about nine years old, and did that kind of work until I was about, uh, I think I was about five or six, when she finally stopped doing that work, and uh, only because my grandfather became ill and we had to move into, into town. So up until that time, we'd been just um, you know, following the migrant trail, living in tents, living in camps, and it was a wonderful life, actually, for me. I know a lot of people say, don't romanticize it, but honestly, for a little kid, it really was a great life. I was with my mother, I was with my grandparents, and life seemed really good to me. When we moved into the city then, I started, uh, I started school how old was I? Well, however, however age you start school. Um, but, um, you know, I didn't speak English, or not a whole lot of English, and so here I was going to go to school, so I was quite worried that nobody would understand me. I didn't, I remember, as old as I am, I remember I didn't sleep all night for worrying that none of the kids would understand what I was saying. So I'm telling you, it was terrible. But I think I must have done okay because I can't remember anything really bad that happened. I learned English in school and just squeaked by on probation. I like to say I was on probation for year after year after year. I finally learned to read and, uh, in the third grade and I became the pride of my grandmother. When I came home, I told her I could read. She invited all the neighbors to come in to hear me read. Well, that was a great day. So I'll move on quickly, because uh, there's a lot of things, you know, as a migrant farm worker, oh, there's a lot of things. I remember so many things, you know, as uh, even after I was older, I, we worked in the fields, like for school clothes, that kind of thing. I didn't work, you know, all the time, but worked on vacation so we could get school clothes, that kind of thing. But I remember it as a very unpleasant work. Um, we, there were no toilets, so there you go. Um, the water, we had to drink out of the same cup. There was only one cup, and there we were drinking out of the same cup. Which even as a young kid, I knew that probably wasn't the best thing. So I remember, I, you know, that stayed in my mind. Uh, that, that type of farm work always stayed with me. Um, now, uh, let's see, um, I probably come out of a different uh, environment, a different set. I was a, a, a mother, a wife, living in the community, raising children, okay, so I wasn't involved in much of anything. But then it came time to, uh, uh, I was involved, well, finally we got involved in the school, school board issues. We found out that there was no services for uh, Spanish-speaking kids. There was no, no type of uh, second language learning, no, no programs for them. So uh, a group of friends and I got involved in that, and we called ourselves the Chicano Advisory Committee. So we were, uh, there was quite a few of us in the beginning. By the end, there was only two of us left, Virginia Sanchez and myself. And so uh, we, you know, we used to uh, call the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to come because we thought that uh, Fresno schools were out of compliance with, uh, you know, all the federal programs, and they did. The Health, Education, and Welfare came to an airport in San Francisco, and we met them there, and we, you know, we just pulled out all of the Fresno kinds of things that they were doing in the school district. And so actually, in the end, they decided to have a suit against Fresno Unified, and they found them out of compliance. So that was just like, wow, that was heady. 
you know, going there, getting those guys to come, getting them to come to the school district, that kind of thing. We had rallies, we, uh, we marched around the, the school, the department of uh, school, and we, I mean, we were just pretty active in that way. That was one thing that I was involved with. And of course, we were all involved in BAPA. That was another thing we were all involved with. And the other thing that, that I had been involved with for quite some time was the uh, political elections. And so during the time of the first Chicanos to run for office, we were very, very involved with that. Alvia's campaign, Armando Rodriguez, and many others. We had started out working for John F. Kennedy campaign. And so the farm workers were very much involved with the JFK campaign, and, uh, as well as with Bobby Kennedy. And so, you know, it was very heady when JFK got elected. We were all just couldn't believe it. So then, then of course, we, you know what happened to JFK. So here comes Bobby, you know, running for office. Again, the uh, farm worker union gets involved with Bobby Kennedy. So there you are. We're, we're involved with Bobby Kennedy. One, the one thing that, that happened as a result of being involved in those political events was that, for example, in JFK's uh, events in Fresno, they brought in special people that knew how to run campaigns. So we were like students, you know, we didn't know how to run a campaign. So we learned so much. And then when Bobby Kennedy's campaign came along, here again we learned so much. So we were able to use what we learned in the local campaigns of Chicanos. So we were determined that things were going to change in this community, that we were going to have Mexican, Latino elected representatives. And for a while we did pretty well. You know, Al got elected and a number of other candidates got elected. But you know, then the tide of course turned against us a little bit. But anyway, that's the community that I came out of when all of this other uh, information that you've heard today came along. So one thing that happened that was very, very um, upsetting to the community Mind you, I'm in the community with all my friends, all the women who are working with the school board, who are doing all these things. So we heard that the faculty of La Raza Studies had been fired. Fired? My goodness. We were like, what? They can't do that to us. So everybody in the community who was not involved became very, very incensed and wanted to be involved. So, in uh, May of 1970, the Rasa Studies faculty was fired, I think, somewhere around there. But the community came so upset that we came out to support the faculty. So that was the time that the, um, we all stood in front of the um, boys' gym. Now, all, uh, and a lot of my friends came. A lot of the other women, you know, that had been involved came. And so, and we brought our kids, which was kind of not, not so smart, but anyway, we did. We thought that would make it seem like it was a good, you know, you bring your family, it's, a, it's an important event that everybody sh should participate in. Okay. So even Father Finian came. I'm sure you all know Father Finian, many of you do. And it was getting very, very, like, hot, you know. Uh, Virginia Sanchez was there, and she was kind of like our leader, and yelling, no school for us, no school for you. And we were just having a glorious time, you know, yelling all that. And we could see the Aggies in the trees, and a lot of picture taking and all that, but you know, what the heck. We're Americans, right? I mean, we have a right to be here. So there we were. Okay, so then Father Finian tells me, okay, he says, I have a baptism to go to, looks at his watch. I said, excuse me, a baptism to go to? He said, yeah, I'm supposed to be there. I said, Father Finian, I know he'd be embarrassed if I said this, and he probably hates me for doing it, but I said, Father Finian, I said, if Jesus were around here, where do you think he would be? Father, well, you know he'd be with us, so come on, stay with us. So I don't know how long he stayed, but I know he wasn't happy with me. So that was that. that, was that. Uh, the Aggies, of course, were everywhere, and um, so it was, it was a difficult time. Um, 
I was, uh, so during all this time, there was just all this pressure. Where was the Chicano faculty going to come from? You know, what was going to happen? So at that time, the students were so involved. They were so in charge of it. They'd taken over the university, let's face it. So what the students did is they interviewed all the faculty. I was never interviewed by any, any administrator in Fresno State. I was interviewed by the students. Leo Gallegos interviewed me. I think he's here somewhere. But anyway, sure enough, we got hired. But we didn't, we, you know, there was nobody that we, that had interviewed us, so we didn't know really if we were hired or not. So there we were, all of us ready to go. So, uh, let's see, I was hired as faculty in 1971, and again, hired by the students. I'm going to skip a little here. Uh, to beyond the 1970s, because there was a, a, just a lot of upheaval from, say, 1970, 71 to, say, 75 and beyond. So there was a five-day dispute in May 1975 with Baxter. All of us uh, faculty resigned over the breakdown of talks with Baxter. We, oh gosh, I'm only, how much of time have I got? One minute? Mm, oh my goodness, I've got five pages left. I just talk too much, that's all. That's one of the things I do. So, um, we had, then we had a sit-in in, in his office, which lasted several days. So the students sat in the office. I went to, the, went to the Thomas, and then I left at night. Now, my excuse was I had to go with my kids, right? But the students stayed, so we actually had a sit-in in Baxter's office, which was so wonderful. We, we took over his office in Thomas. Uh, the dispute was over the La Raza studies and whether it would be given uh, departmental status. So up until 75, we still didn't have departmental status. So, it, you know, he had to deal with us. He knew that we were, it was big, lots of students, lots of faculty.